Hello everyone, back tuning in to today's video, doing the Sunday Roundup. As always at Gaz Office, we're going to get uh, various things together and have a bit of a uh, extensive uh, musing this Sunday uh, afternoon. Later on today, we'll uh, start the uh, Easter countdown. So uh, we'll begin our updates using the GFS model, uh, see what weather could be doing for uh, Easter. We'll do regular updates over the next couple of weeks as we run up to the Easter bank holiday uh, weekend and talking of Easter, uh, of course, we're going to be launching the um, Gas of East competition in a week's time. So, a week today, we'll be starting our competition in association with metcheck.co.uk weather instrumentation. We'll be running it for a week, and the uh, winner will be announced and revealed uh, two weeks today. Uh, 16th of April, which is, of course, Easter Day. So, um, I'll have all the detail about how you can enter, what we're going to be giving away, all of that kind of thing. Uh, over the next few days, not sure when uh, we'll reveal the prize, but uh, it's a very unusual prize uh, this time, um, and very uh, bespoke, uh, really. It can be uh, very specific to the person uh, that wins it. But I'll have more about that uh, over the coming few days. Of course, we're starting the competition a week today. We'll be announcing the winner two weeks today on Easter Sunday. This is metcheck.co.uk weather instrumentation's website, by the way. They give away uh, or they sell loads of uh, products, weather-related products. So if uh, you want to buy any thermometers, rain gauges, anemometers, that kind of thing, uh, do go to metcheck.co.uk. You can find a link to them on the links page. Uh, come to their website and buy all of those uh, wonderful uh, items if you would like uh, to do that. Right, getting on uh, with today's video then, we're going to start off with solar activity uh, today. So this is the solar disk on our side of this today from solarham.net. Uh, we've had a little bit of an increase in sunspots over the past few days, so we've got quite a bit of activity going on. Uh, across the solar disk at the moment uh, and officially from Soham the um, solar activity is up at moderate levels uh, today so but we've gone up from low and very low levels where we've been for quite a long time uh, back up to uh, moderate uh, sunspot uh, numbers sunspot uh, levels so we are seeing a bit of an increase in activity at the moment. Uh, our good friend James Aquil has updated the Gavs Weather Vids uh, solar activity tracker, and this is reflecting the um, this is reflecting the increase in activity that we've had over the past few days. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had no sunspots at all for several days. Had a run of around uh, ten days to two weeks of almost no sunspots. Then uh, they increased a little bit uh, uh, through the final stages of um, March and then they had a big push up as we went towards the very end of March up there. We went back at sort of levels we've not been at really since uh, back in the autumn and you probably have to go back into the summer actually just here to uh, find uh, a higher level of sunspot activity compared to uh, where we are right now. So uh, sunspots have moved up quite a lot. That is having a um, impact on the trend lines, which are the uh, thick green and the thick red lines, just here, or thick orange lines. They're all beginning to tick up a little bit as well. Uh, we know we're moving into um, we're moving into solar minimum, of course, but uh, it's not a linear process. You don't uh, go directly down into solar minimum. You get uh, various uh, spikes upwards in activity whilst the trend moves down. So you can always expect these um, ramp ups in sunspot numbers and solar activity until you arrive at true solar minimum. We'll be there in around a year, eighteen months time when you get. To true solar minimum, then you go through several weeks and months of um, virtually no sunspots at all. So um, it's expected, but we get these uh, increases in uh, sunspot numbers. This our uh, solar cycle 24 is looking overall. This is updated up to March. Again, uh, Jane sent this through. So um, we can see that uh, we started off at solar minimum for solar cycle 24 uh, back in 2008. Very, very gradual increase in uh, solar activity through 2009 um, and 2010 as well, arriving at the first peak, first maximum, for uh, solar cycle 24 
uh, at the end of 2011 into the start of 2012. Then uh, activity levelled off and dropped through most of 2012 before we had another uh, a double maximum and the second peak was actually higher than the first peak, which is quite unusual for um, uh, solar cycles. Uh, that happened at the start of 2014. That's when the solar maximum of this uh, very weak solar cycle number 24 occurred since when the trend is obviously very much uh, downhill all the way um but you can see from these uh, orange spots that it isn't as i say a linear process so for example uh that's where uh, the solar maximum occurred at the beginning of solar cycle 24. Then we had several months moving downwards and then we get a spike upwards then we go down again and then we get another spike, and then we go down again to there, quite a big plunge there at the uh, end of 2014, and another spike, and so on. And now this is where we are right now, up to March uh, this year, up to last month. And uh, you see we're back more or less uh, where we was just there. That's back to 2009-2010 uh, type levels. Now, of course, 2009-2010 is when we're getting lots of cold winters. We're not getting cold winters now, even though sunspot numbers are around uh, those sort of levels that we was in 2009-2010. Of course, the difference is that in uh, 2009 and 2010, we're coming out of the long solar minimum. Whereas right now, although the, the overall sunspot numbers are the same, uh, right now we are still unravelling the solar maximum that occurred in 2014. So the best time to get blocking, and there is an association between weak solar activity, uh, low sunspot numbers, and northern blocking, particularly, particularly on the Eurasian side of the pole. The best time to get uh, blocking in the winter is as you come out of solar minimum. So around solar minimum and then two or three years coming out of solar minimum. That's the best time to get cold winters from northern blocking via probably a reduction in the strength of the jet stream through a weakening of solar activity coming across the Atlantic. This period in the solar cycle, as you're moving away from solar maximum and you're going into solar minimum, Although the overall sunspot numbers are the same as you get when you're coming out of solar minimum, uh, this period of the solar cycle is never as conducive to producing uh, colder winters and northern blocking. Never write anything off because you can get a cold winter at any point, just like you can get a mild winter at any point. And even in those periods where you move out of solar minimum, uh, which is uh, statistically the best time, best chance of getting uh, colder winters, even then it's not a guarantee. You might still get milder winters through that period. So at any point you get a cold winter, at any point you can get a mild winter, um, it's just loading the dice, kind of, in favour of a certain outcome. Uh, and then finally for uh, solar activity, this is uh, comparing solar cycles 12 and 24. Solar cycle number 12, of course, was the uh, old solar cycle back in the Victorian era, era ran from 1878 to 1890. Uh, and solar cycle 24, as you know, is the current solar cycle. These two solar cycles appear to have aligned uh, quite closely with one another. So, again, the way they uh, had a very slow move uh, movement out of solar minimum at the beginning of both of these solar cycles were very similar the maximums of these solar cycles was also uh, quite similar as well with a double peak and unusually the second peak of uh, the solar cycles was above the first peak and that's quite unusual normally the first peak of the solar cycle is actual solar maximum and the second peak normally comes out a little bit underneath it so that's quite unusual and they both did the same kind of thing with the uh, solar maximums of both of these solar cycles uh, and then the way we've moved down out of solar um, uh, maximum and headed into solar minimum has also been quite uh, similar this is where we are right now in terms of uh, so cycle number 24, this orange spot just here. And uh, again, very much along the lines of where uh, we was at this point in the solar cycle of number 12. So um, we are still quite closely aligned with these two solar cycles. And 
in the earlier part of this solo cycle, it appeared that the Winters were lining up very closely to the Winters of solo cycle 12 as well. But we have broken away from that quite a bit uh, over the last two or three Winters. Um, we have broken away from the Winters of solo cycle 12. So that connection may have uh, gone away. But the overall sunspot numbers and the way the uh, cycles are progressing appears to still be uh, quite closely aligned. Big thank you to James for sending all of those updated charts through to us. We'll keep an eye on solar activity, of course, as we head down into solar minimum. Uh, just want to throw this in. This is uh, Arctic sea ice extent. We looked at this uh, last week. I'll just uh, close you in a bit more. So um, we have reached our peak of uh, uh, sea ice extent for this season. Uh, and uh, we are beginning now to see the melt season of um, this year getting going. So this blue line just here, for some reason, it's quite a light colour, so it's a little bit hard to uh, make out on the white background. Um, but uh, this blue line just here is the uh, Arctic melt season for 2018. And uh, 17. You see, we reached our peak back here, and uh, now we are very slowly beginning to reduce the uh, ice and will continue to melt the uh, Arctic sea ice um, right way through to around September when we reach our uh, minimum sea ice extent. You see, we are well below the uh, average for um, the 10 year average in terms of uh, Arctic sea ice extent, so we didn't have as much, well, we haven't got as much ice as we uh, would normally do so on average uh, right now. So we're starting from a very low base. We're also well under um, 2012. That's the death spiral year. That's indicated by this green dash line. Uh, that's where the minimum uh, sea ice extent occurred in 2012. Uh, it was a real plunge, a bit of a death spiral in terms of Arctic sea ice. Well under that. But just because we're under 2012 doesn't mean we're going to finish up uh, underneath 2012 in terms of the melt season, in terms of the minimum that we reach in September. At some point, we may find this uh, blue line doing something a little bit like that and uh, it might in the end finish up actually retaining more ice uh, than we did in 2012. You never know. But we are st certainly starting from a very uh, low level in terms of Arctic uh, sea ice. So have a quick look at the oceans, and this is the situation in the Pacific right now. Uh, so we've still got this warming here in the eastern part of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. There's still a bit of a signature of El Nino trying to get going over there. I think it is struggling, though. It isn't, uh, it isn't rolling very quickly and developing very quickly into an El Nino event over the past month or probably six weeks now. There's been very little development here in the eastern equatorial uh, Pacific Ocean. Over in the western equatorial Pacific Ocean, we still have the decaying signature of the really weak landing year that we had um, over the winter. So that's going, and the question will be whether we move on into El Nino by the summer. I suspect the reason uh, the El Nino signature is uh, struggling more this year is probably because the northern Pacific has become quite cold, particularly up here in the north eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. It's turned really cold up there, and uh, I've been saying over the past two or three years, because I've had a lot of warm water up there since around 2014, I've been saying it's quite unusual. Normally, that's a very cold part of the ocean, and it's returned more to where you would expect the temperatures to be. That is more like how you'd expect temperatures to be looking in terms of the sea surface temperature anomalies in the northeast and Pacific Ocean compared to what we've seen over the past two or three years. Because it's gone cold in the northern Pacific, I suspect this El Nino, if it does get going, I suspect it's unlikely to uh, snowball into a Super Nino. You can never rule anything out. But I think a Super Nino this time, unlike in 2015 when it was much warmer, in the northern Pacific Ocean. I think a Super Nino this time is quite unlikely. If we do get El Nino, it's likely to be a weaker event. I would have thought that next year we would probably go 
into a proper La Nina, a proper cold event. We didn't really have a proper La Nina this uh, year, this winter just gone. Um, that might be where things go for the winter of 20, uh, it'll be 2018-2019. So for 2017-2018, might have a week El Nino, and then the winter of 2018-2019, possibly going into a proper La Nina event. In the Atlantic Ocean, things are looking quite cool, actually, in the northern Atlantic Ocean, near normal, uh, really, but in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean, it does look uh, quite cool up there. So certainly the uh, sea surface temp temperature anomalies in the Atlantic do not look uh, overly warm at this stage. Uh, going back to the uh, Arctic Oscillation then, this is the uh, Arctic Oscillation Observed and Forecast chart. The black line here tells us where the uh, Arctic Oscillation has been, going right way back to the start of December. Uh, the red line is where the GFS ensembles are forecasting the Arctic Oscillation to go. Remember, this is just an index that's reflecting the state of the uh, atmosphere in the North Pole. It's not driving anything, just telling you what the uh, atmosphere, what the uh, where the setup is doing, if, if you like. So when the Arctic Oscillation is positive, you've got lots of low pressure in the North Pole and you're enhancing the westerlies across the Atlantic. When the Arctic Oscillation is negative, you're weakening the westerlies and you're probably producing some sort of northern blocking. So through most of the winter, the Arctic Oscillation uh, was positive. We've had around four months now of positivity of the Arctic Oscillation. We did go a bit negative there through the first half of February when we had a go at getting a Scandinavian high going. But overall, it has been uh, a positive Arctic Oscillation uh, period for around four months. Uh, the red lines here indicate that initially we're forecasting via the GFS ensembles the Arctic Oscillation to continue to be positive. But it does look like they are trending down as we're going into the middle part of April. That's this period just here. It looks like we're moving down with the Arctic Oscillation. Possibly signs there that uh, the AO is beginning to trend to more negative territory. That might be associated with high pressure or heights beginning to increase across the Arctic. It's possible that we might get a bit of a cold snap through the middle part of uh, April. Won't be very good news for growers or farmers, of course. And uh, the real question with this, because the Arctic Oscillation tends to move in blocks of around three to four months, and you can see we have been through a block of around four months of positivity of the Arctic Oscillation. The real question is whether this is a trend now, but we're going into, say, three or four months of negative Arctic Oscillation condition. If we are, then this could have impacts Particularly on the early uh, summer weather pattern, we might find ourselves going into a much cooler, much more unsettled type period through the uh, later, latter part of the spring and into the early summer. So uh, that could be one to keep an eye on. We'll keep you updated with the Arctic Oscillation. North Atlantic Oscillation, very similar. Again, the black line here tells us where we've been with the North Atlantic Oscillation. Red lines at the end where the GFS Ensemble is forecasting North Atlantic Oscillation to go. It's not driving anything. It's just telling you what the atmosphere is doing. As with the Arctic Oscillation, it's been a positive NAO winter as well. You can see that quite clearly from this black line. GFS Ensembles forecasting the NAO to stay positive for a while. But as we go through into the second week of April, this period just here, again, we might be seeing a trend down into a negative NAO. So it looks like it's headed towards the middle part of April. The two indexes, the AO and the NAO, might be trending more towards uh, negativity. And that might lead to something uh, cooler, perhaps colder, and more unsettled for the middle part of April. GFS temperature and precipitation ensembles the next two weeks show this uh, quite well, actually. So the red line here is a 30-year temperature average in terms of the upper air temperatures. We've got the dates on the bottom. So through the first week of April, this period just here, you see overall it is a very mild period coming up. Temperatures are going to be above average. But sometime around the 9th, 10th of April, this period just here, we are trending those temperatures down. And there are actually several members of the GFS on Solis that are going really quite cold, certainly for the time of year, to go under minus 5 at 850 HPA. That's quite a cold level. So at the very least, it looks like we're going to turn cooler through the second week of April. We can't rule out the chance that it could actually turn 
quite cold. It's not too late for snow, particularly in the north. And the main point, basically, it's not too late for frost. And frost at this time of year can be very, very damaging, particularly to uh, fruit growers, but also uh, to gardeners as well. Lots of dry weather coming up for the uh, next week. That's this period just here where we have these warm upper air temperatures. And then as it turns cooler, it looks like it's turning more unsettled as well. So the middle part of April, the moment, it looks like it's shaping up to be quite a cool and unsettled period. And I say we'll have the first update for Easter uh, this evening. Temperature anomalies look like this for the next week, milder than average, but I would expect these to train cooler over the uh, next few days. We'll keep an eye on these in the coming week. This taking us from the 2nd through to the 10th of April. Looks like it's a milder than average period. Precipitation anomalies from the 2nd to the 10th of April coming out significantly drier than average, not just for the UK, but, but uh, for many western parts of Europe as well. Here's the GFS for Thursday, then high pressure is dominating the weather on Thursday and it continues into Friday as well uh, also continuing into the weekend so uh, Saturday looks like it'll be a mostly dry day but keep an eye on this area of low pressure up here around Iceland see where that's going as you're heading towards Sunday pushed into Scandinavia the heights begin to pull out into the Atlantic we're trying to get wind down or around into the north. We bring a little bit of a northerly down across the country by Monday the 10th of April, starting to turn cooler, certainly, and more unsettled. As we head up towards day 10, this takes us to Wednesday the 12th of April, where we find low pressure deepening over Norway, and a proper northerly is really uh, starting to set in. If you follow the isobars back, you can see that the air is going right way back, into uh, the Arctic. So that's a proper northerly beginning to push down as this high pressure retrogresses out into the Atlantic, starts to move up towards green. Remember, retrogression is where you take pressure, uh, or high pressure normally, but can be low pressure. Usually it's high pressure. You take high pressure from uh, east to west as opposed to the zonal flow, which is west to east, and that's the typical uh, flow that we have in this country. Those uh, northerlies continue through to Thursday the 13th. That's Maundy Thursday, of course, just before uh, Easter. And look at those up rare temperatures, bringing the minus 10 isotherm down across the country. That's probably over the top. It would be very unusual to get uh, up rare temperatures that cold um, in the middle of April. But certainly it would be a bit of a northerly shot and it would be enough to produce quite a bit of uh, frost and probably for the north, some snow showers. Finally, the east of the US, so high pressure dominating uh, for much of this week up to Friday. It looks mostly dry and settled. That continues into the weekend as well. Fairly warm and about high pressure by the weekend, I'd have thought. Uh, up to Monday the 10th, there's the first cold front beginning to move down, introducing cooler, not especially cold, but cooler conditions by then with some outbreaks of rain. And as we go up towards day 10, this takes us to Wednesday the 12th of April, which is day 10. We've got this area of low pressure out to the northwest. So still not overly cold, but I would suspect if we could roll on another 24 hours, we would probably find this low pressure doing a bit of a plunge. We've got heights rising in the Atlantic and heading up towards Greenland. So that will force the low pressure down to the east and south. And I suspect if we could roll on another 24 hours, we would probably find the wind going into the north, same as the GFS is uh, indicating. So perhaps growing uh, possibility this morning of a cold snap around the middle part of April coinciding, wouldn't you just know it, with uh, Easter. Um, it's all a very long way off, though, so I wouldn't necessarily be too uh, concerned. But if you are a grower, particularly if you're a fruit grower, uh, I would keep an eye on where this is going as we head up towards the uh, middle of April, because this time of year, um, particularly frost, uh, can be really quite damaging. Right, that's your uh, Gazwell well, Sunday Roundup uh, for... This Sunday, um, later on today, as I say, we're going to be starting the countdown to Easter. So have a look at the GFS uh, going through the whole of the uh, Easter period. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.